I'd like to welcome everybody to the um, uh, next uh, dialogue in our series of dialogues sponsored by the Princeton University, University of Tokyo Strategic Partnership. Uh, my name is Jim Ramo. I am in the sociology department at Princeton and the faculty director of the strategic partnership. And I'm joined here by Professor Masashi Haneda, who is the president of Tokyo College and has been my uh, uh, co-conspirator in organizing these um, uh, sessions, uh, which have uh, focused to a large degree on various ways in which our world uh, has changed and may continue to change in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and tonight uh, we have uh, the real pleasure of welcoming two of our colleagues, uh, one at Princeton and one at the University of Tokyo, who are both uh, uh, world-renowned economists and will be talking to us uh, about some of the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the, some of the implications um, for uh, economic processes uh, in the economy today and beyond. So what we're gonna do first is to have, um, well, let me say a little bit about the partnership before we get started. Um, for those of you who don't, um, uh, haven't had a chance to see some of the earlier sessions. So the partnership is uh, one of a small number of strategic partnerships at Princeton and a larger number of strategic partnerships at the University of Tokyo. And it's been in place since 2013. And basically this is a, um, uh, a linkage between two universities that is designed to foster collaborative relationships, uh, collaborative research uh, projects that might not have happened otherwise. And one of the other really critical components of this partnership uh, is its emphasis on bringing students in and encouraging uh, training uh, of graduate students and undergraduate students across the two institutions to provide um, something more than the students uh, at these two <laughs> wonderful universities might be able to get only uh, at their home university. Um, the partnership has sponsored, uh, gosh, now 25, 27 um, projects over the past uh, eight years in an incredibly uh, diverse uh, array of fields. So it's not just economics, it's not just uh, the social sciences, but really across the entire uh, uh, campus uh, of both uh, universities. And it's something that we have really uh, worked hard to invigorate over these last couple of years when we haven't been able to meet each other on a regular basis. And I think we've been able to do a lot of really good things and build some momentum. Uh, so when we come out of this, hopefully soon, uh, we'll be able to really um, engage in a lot of uh, meaningful face-to-face uh, -face, uh, collaborative uh, partnership activities. So we look forward to those. But again, uh, as I was saying, today we'll be focusing on the COVID-19 pandemic and the economy. And uh, I will turn things over to my colleague, um, uh, Masashi Haneda, who will introduce um, uh, uh, Professor Hoshi from the University of Tokyo. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, from my side as well, I'm very happy to welcome uh, two world-leading uh, economists uh, at this uh, dialogue series uh, between Princeton and the University of Tokyo. And let me introduce uh, Professor Takeo Hoshi, I call him in American name all because he has been uh, he has been uh, he worked uh, in the U.S. for more than uh, thirty years, and he 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 he's got used, he get used to uh, be called in American style, and he uh, of course uh, many of you know very well that he is a, a great economist uh, focusing on corporate finance, microeconomic policy. And uh, and the banking regulation and overall he's very interested in Japanese economy, and uh, uh, he, he has published uh, a book uh, uh, in, uh, with Takeo uh, Takatoshi Ito uh, entitled the Japanese economy. And last year he no not last year, yeah it was it was last year. And after the publishment uh, of the second version. Uh, he uh, uh, planned to, to organize a series of dialogues between uh, Takatoshi Ito and uh, him uh, by using uh, the, the, the uh, channel of the uh, Tokyo College and uh, uh, promoting uh, that book uh, uh, very much. And uh, that series was uh, very popular and very successful. 
and he, he got his PhD at MIT in 1988. And after that, he spent more than 20 years in, in uh, the University of uh, California, San Diego, uh, before moving to uh, uh, Stanford University. And he came back to Tokyo uh, in uh, 2019, three years ago, just before the COVID-19. And then two years, two years, yeah, uh, two years, uh, two years ago, yeah, two years ago, and then uh, he starts his uh, job uh, as uh, the dean of the School of Economics this year from uh, last April. So uh, I would like to welcome uh, Takeo Hoshi a lot uh, in this uh, dialogue series. And Jim, please. Thank you. And um, likewise, it is my real pleasure to uh, welcome and to introduce uh, my colleague here at Princeton, Marcus Brunermeyer. He is a professor of economics, and he is also the director of the Vendheim Center for Finance here. And I'll call him Marcus, <laughs> since we're being informal here. Uh, Marcus is a macroeconomist, and his work focuses on financial markets. And within um, that uh, field, he has a, a range of emphases, but um, from a uh, uh, an outsider looking in, some of the ones that are particularly interesting to me are, are sort of hot topics in the field, such as bubbles and digital money. Uh, that's, I don't know if we're going to talk about that tonight, but those are um, some of the areas that he's working in. And uh, he's, he's really somebody who is incredibly active on the international stage. He's affiliated with a number of prominent research groups, including the National Bureau of Economic Research and many others uh, around the world. And very uh, impressively, uh, from my perspective, and importantly, uh, serves in a range of advisory uh, and consulting positions, um, including very uh, prominently uh, on the panel of economic advisors for the Congressional Budget Office. And he's the author of numerous articles and several important books. And among those books, there's one that's going to be particularly important for our conversation uh, today. And it's his most recent uh, book called The Resilient Society, an award-winning book. And he's going to start the conversation uh, today with an overview of, of this book. Um, it's, it, this is, I, I think, a really nice opportunity because, A, it allows him to uh, give listeners uh, an overview of what this important book is about, but also it provides a real, I, I think, nice basis, an important and logical basis for the conversations that we want to have uh, today uh, with the two of them about the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has um, shaped, impacted uh, economic processes. So um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Marcus, uh, and uh, we will um, take a back seat and look forward to uh, listening and learning from the two of you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jim. It's a pleasure. And thanks to all of you for giving me this opportunity to discuss uh, my book and perhaps going beyond that. And uh, I prepared a few slides and I thought I, I share the slides and then uh, uh, we can go further in the discussion. Um, so I'm very happy to give you some uh, introduction to the book. And uh, I'm also very excited that it will come out in Japanese, hopefully in the spring. Uh, so then we can you know, build the bridges between the US and Japan even further. So when you look at the current environment, you think you know, there's a lot of shocks we are facing. And you know, we have the pandemic, we have the COVID, we have some antibiotic resistance, but which is very, very important. Financial crisis, cyber attacks, natural disasters. And typically, you know, crises don't come along, they come in pairs or triplets. And the book tries to understand, you know, how to best handle these crises and how to make sure that we are resilient. You know, and what before I talk about resilience, I think it's important to say what is it? And sometimes it's easy to say what it is not. And so we'll start with some similar concepts which are not resilience. And the first similar concept I would like to, to talk about is ro about robustness. So robustness is about you know, withstanding any shock or most shocks. So you don't move at all. You're very rigid uh, standing there. While resilience is essentially giving in and bouncing back. So you're much more volatile, much more moving around, and, but you have the ability to bounce back. And there's this nice uh, parable by La Fontaine in the 17th century French writer who compares the oak with the reed. And the oak essentially is very strong and very rigid and withstands most winds coming from there while the reed is actually swinging back and forth and seems very weak and volatile. 
But when the storm is very, very strong, extremely strong, the oak falls over and can't come back up while the reed is still bouncing back. And then actually the reed says to the oak in this parable, I bend, I bow, but I do not break. And I think what resilience is, and that reflects the resilience, is not to be rigid, but to be flexible and agile and move back and forth and then come back. And you don't have this robustness barrier. So if you're very robust, you might, if the shock is large enough, you break through the robustness barrier, and then the oak can't come back while the reed is still bouncing back. So robustness is different from resilience. And if you're very resilient, you constantly move around and it seems like you're weak and very volatile, but actually it is part of the strength that you constantly move around because it's also a sign that you don't break through a robustness barrier. So resilience is different from robustness. And I would argue that, you know, society should be more resilient rather than robust. You have to be, you know, inviting people who think differently and have some diversity and move and change is way more important than being a very rigid society and not bouncing back. Resilience is also different from risk. So when we think about risk, it's typically a static concept. It's, you know, it's about the variance and, you know, how far is the shock? Is this one-time shock? But resilience is more dynamic concept. It's over time. So you have a shock and then you come back. And the question is, how quickly can you come back? And, you know, will you be coming back to the an old normal or to the new normal and how to make sure that we come back and how to organize things that we can actually bounce back. Then typically when you are more resilient, you can actually take on more risks because when you look at certain risks, you can bounce back. And what I've depicted here, I've had some Japanese examples where you look at the Japanese GDP data and you see a lot of um, lack of resilience, especially when you have financial crisis. So I worked a lot in my life on financial crisis. And financial crisis are actually crises where the economy is not very resilient. So you have a shock and the economy is not coming back. And what you see here is like the projection from GDP if we didn't have the financial crisis. So you bounce down, but you don't bounce back. And actually the growth rate, the slope is actually lower as well. If we look at the financial crisis, uh, the global financial crisis comes, uh, goes back. But on the other hand, if you look at Fukushima, which was, you know, you didn't see it in the long run, you bounce back and then actually was continuing the, the same speed as before. So there are certain risks and certain shocks where you can bounce back, you're resilient to, and certain shocks and risks where you're not uh, resilient to. And it's very important to identify and classify shocks accordingly. And if you identify something that's difficult to bounce back, you can either try to work on it, but if you can't bounce back, you should try to avoid these shocks. So you really have to identify these type of shocks. So what are these resilience destroyers? And there are three types of resilience destroyers. One is a trap. So if you have a shock, you will be trapped and you can't come back as a point of no return. That's one form of a resilience destroyer. A one, another one is some, if you enter into some adverse feedback loops, then you are shocked and then you enter in adverse feedback loops. It's even worse than a trap. Not, you're not only trapped, but you come, it gets even worse. And the third one are tipping points. And you have this lot in climate change, you know, if for example, the Gulf Storm were to stop, it would become worse and worse. So you have a situation, things get worse, you're, you're shocked to a tipping point, and then the whole situation spirals out of control. So these are the resilience destroyers. And when you do the analysis and think which shock should we avoid and which ones we have to look out for, you have to look out for the ones which are very, you know, suffer from these traps, feedbacks, and tipping points. Now, resilience comes at different levels. It comes at an individual level. So you can be resilient. If you face a personal shock, will you bounce back? And there's a lot of written about it in psychology literature and other fields. And the book doesn't say so much about on this aspect. But resilience also comes at a system level. So you can have a network, you have global value chains, or you have banks or platforms, and they become more or less resilient. It depends how many redundancies you have, how many buffers you have. So that's for systems. What the book really focuses on is on the resilience of a society. And that's slightly different. Of course, individuals have to be resilient for the society to be resilient, but you have to set up a society which is self-stabilizing and can bounce back. 
And when you talk about a society, it's all about interaction of people and how they respond to shocks from others. And what I focus here in particular on is externalities and the response to externalities. So the key is here, what's the endogenous reaction of others? So here's a little picture where I have two people, person A and person B. The person A is doing something, acts on something, and it causes a negative externality, let's say, on person B. So it has a negative effect from the action of person A. And that's actually, we talk a lot in economic about externalities and how control externalities. And I would argue that's very important, it leads to market failures and all that. But what makes it even worse, if the person B reacts in a particular way, which then leads to an externality back to person A, which reacts again, who reacts again, and then it leads to another externality and you have this feedback loop and what I call feedback externalities. So simple externalities are actually also bad, but they're not so bad, but if they're coupled with uh, feedbacks and in eco language, language it's called you know, strategic complementarities, then they get really, really bad because they amplify dramatically and then they make the situation much, much worse. And you really want to keep track of these feedback externalities to control what's going on. So what you do is you have a social contract and the social contract tries to limit these externalities. There are two types of externalities. One is which comes from other people, that's the classic externalities. And if they're feedback externalities, they're even worse. And then there are also what I call externalities from mother nature. These are just shocks. And if you have shocks and if they're idiosyncratic shocks, so they're different from person to person, you can ensure uh, the society can ensure each other. But how to implement this social contract? Uh, you can do it in different ways. And one is through social norms. And you know, I use in the book a lot, Japan as an example of where social norms are very prominent and play an important role. Of course, in any society, social norms play an important role. And having a common identity, a sense of community, and being very homogeneous actually promotes strong social norms. But the problem with social norms is that they are just very slowly. And if there's a shock, and you have to you know, change the social norms because you have to react to the shock, the social norms typically don't adjust very quickly. For that, actually, it is much better if the government enforcement, it can adjust the laws much more quickly than social norms adjust. And typically we, the way we internalize externalities is through a government enforcement, a Peruvian taxes or some subsidies. So, but it comes typically with surveillance and a loss of privacy, but you can adjust much more quickly. And, and the third approach is essentially you have, some, you have some markets, you have some property rights you can trade and typically the markets are working in, better in aggregating information which is dispersed in the society. But uh, the problem with markets is that, you know, they only work in a certain range. If the shock is large enough, markets are not self-stabilizing, they're destabilizing. So then the government has to come in and essentially stabilize the situation again. And typically you have, you know, these three players or three ways of implementing a social contract to avoid these externalities, be it from others or from mother nature, so these shocks. And what is a resilient social contract is if you can actually adjust. So here, put a little dot here within this triangle and depends which society you live in, they put more emphasis on social norms or more emphasis on the government or more emphasis on markets. But if you have a very resilient society, it also means you can adjust how much weight you put uh, on this uh, as you go about it. So and there's another picture which I just took from the book. If you compare, for example, uh, Germany and, and Japan, What's striking, at least in the first part of the COVID crisis, what was very striking, if you look at the stringency index for Germany, Germany was imposing way stricter measures. So the government enforcement was way stricter in, Japan, in Germany compared to Japan. So the dark uh, line is the German stringency index going to 80, almost 100%, while the Japanese stringency index was way, way weaker. And the government was not intervening so much compared to uh, Germany. And, uh, but on, in contrast, the number of cases you had, COVID cases, 
were way more pronounced uh, in Germany. So despite the fact that the Japanese government was not intervening so much, it had you know, much fewer COVID cases. And one argument could be that you know, the social norms were much more strong uh, pronounced, uh, were much more, everybody was wearing face masks automatically, no rule had to be changed and no police had to enforce it. And that actually made this uh, very different society much better to, to handle these uh, things because uh, social norms helped out much more and you needed in other countries, you needed the government to intervene. So what the, what the book does essentially, it moves through a, a wide, wide range of um, uh, policy uh, applications. And it actually, in, I benefited a lot from having organized a webinar series on the COVID crisis where you know, almost every week uh, I invited some uh, key speaker to outline you know, his insights from the COVID crisis, what are the implications for economics and beyond. And the book reflects the insights that I got from all these various speakers. So part of the credit goes essentially to many, many others, not uh, just to me. And the key is essentially for uh, being resilient is to have redundancies, but redundancies which are easily redeployable. So it's not a redundancy which is fixed, it's a flexible redundancy. You can re shift around depending what the shock is and you have very flexible responses. But the book starts with some health aspects, you know, how to manage the health uh, crisis, particularly the pandemic and how to reach a new normal. So many countries have focused very much on the crisis containment, the containment strategies, but they have not really focused on how to bounce back or to the new normal focusing on vaccines. And also it also explains how the vaccine should be developed, how many you should do develop in parallel, how different they should be in order to have diversification benefits and so forth. Then there's a whole part of the book which focuses on the macroeconomy. Uh, just one example is if the interest rate is low as it is right now, it's way easier for the government to issue debt because the interest burden is, is not so big. And this gives more space for the governments to act, but it gives less space for central banks to act because central banks uh, face, uh, they can't cut the interest rate so much further because they're already close to the zero interest rate or even negative territory. There's not so much room to stimulate the economy uh, because they face uh, some constraint how much they cut, can cut the interest rate further. Then there's parts of the book which deals with financial economy and argues, you know, you need some efficient debt restructuring. If people or firms suffer from too much debt and you can't restructure the debt, that drags down the economy. It makes it hard to bounce back. If you can get rid of debt overhang problems and also associated stigmas with being overly indebted, uh, then actually you can bounce back, back more easily. If you go to the international economy, having flexible exchange rate is easy. It helps to bounce back because you, know, you suffer shock, you depreciate your exchange rate, then it boosts your exports. And this way you can bring the economy back more quickly. It talks about distributed ledger technology. It talks about the global value chains where there's a strong focus before the COVID crisis on just in time. Now we have to focus much more on just in case. Through the global financial crisis, we have learned a lot how important stress testing is. And you know, perhaps we want to have some stress tests for global value chains down the road. And we see the whole the shortages we're experiencing now because of global value chains not working as smoothly as they worked before. And then the final book of the final part of the book focuses on global geopolitics, on the global role of the dollar and all the emerging economies on the poverty traps, which is another form of non-resilience, a trap like a poverty trap or middle income trap. These are all traps which kill essentially are very bad for resilience. And then there's a, a chapter on climate change, which talks very much on tipping points and what is sustainability as a concept. So sustainability is a broader concept than resilience. So if an, a system is not resilient, it's also not sustainable. But sustainability requires more than resilience because you could have a, an adverse trend, you know, it's slowly going uh, down the drain, essentially. It's very resilient, but, you know, there's no volatility, there's no shocks and bouncing back element to that, uh, but it would not help either. So you need resilience and the absence of an adverse trend in order to have 
uh, some sustainable system or economy or society. Now, finally, so here's the outline of the book, and then I will conclude. So as I mentioned, at the, what I alluded to was first in the first part, and then there's the macro part, and then there's a the global part uh, to it. And uh, that gives you perhaps, a, it's very hard to summarize a book of 400 pages in 10 minutes, uh, but I hope I give you a little glimpse and, and whet the appetite uh, for looking into the book. I'm looking forward to a depth discussion uh, on this topic. Thanks again. It's fascinating that I can be with you and here in this format. Thank you so much, Marcus. I, I, I would have to say that um, you, you did an admirable job of the difficult task of summarizing 400 pages in 10 minutes. I, I, I feel like I know a lot more uh, of, about the issues now. So I'm going to turn things over to Takeo, who uh, I, I know has um, several thoughts and, and uh, points he'd like to discuss with you with respect to the book, and particularly the ways in which they may or may not um, be particularly applicable in the Japanese context. So, Takeo, okay, it's all yours. Okay, Th thank you, Jim. And thank you, Masashi, for a very nice introduction. Yes, I'll change my background to a uh, Tokyo <laughs> College one uh, to show I I'm a project professor at Tokyo College as well. And uh, thank you, Marcus, for uh, giving a very nice, very brief summary of your book. Uh, I just read, read your book and uh, I've been impressed. And uh, so I, I was looking forward to uh, today, this discussion. Um, as you mentioned, um, your, your book focuses on this idea of resilience. I, I mean, I, I don't have, you don't have time to go over the entire book. I don't have time to comment your entire book. So I, I'd like to pick uh, some of the points you made. And the first thing I want to mention is I like the emphasis, your emphasis on resilience over robustness. And I've been studying the Japanese economy uh, and I find the Japanese economy often try to be robust rather than resilient. And I think it cost the Japanese economy. So when it faces a large economic shock, uh, Japan often tries to protect the status quo and fail to be resilient. And if, you, if I use your analogy, the Japan tries to be oak rather than the reed. And I, I think that's been costing the Japanese economy. Um, and this is, you also, what, what you also have pointed out using a figure for, for Japan uh, that shows uh, Japanese real GDP and that failed to come back to the pre-crisis trend after each crisis. And I, I think th there are multiple reasons why the Jap Japanese economy was not resilient and uh, you know, which relates to many of the points you mentioned in the book. But I want to point out or focus on one important reason that is a low level of economic dynamism or creative destruction. I mean, you spend a lot of time on the idea of creative destruction and how it is important, uh, it is an important driving force for economic growth in your book. Uh, obviously, you didn't have time to go over that part uh, this morning uh, in very details. But uh, uh, what the policies to resist shocks and preserve status quo, uh, which uh, Japan took, does is to suppress the destruction, including the creative one. And as a result, the economy goes back to a lower growth trends than before, as you, as you showed uh, in your figure for Japan. So I think that's been a very important problem for the Japanese economy and your idea of uh, your concept of resilience or robustness versus resilience explain the Japan failure. And looking at Japan during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I see the Japanese economy may be showing the same progress, problem, the lack of resilience again. And uh, th this relates to another point you made. Uh, you made the point that the Japan has a strong social norm. And that's good in some sense, in some areas, but make it hard to adjust. So, so that's uh, another thing you mentioned. Uh, and the dominant policies, dominant economic policies under COVID-19 in Japan have been, again, those to resist changes and protect the status quo. So for example, 
the Japanese government rolled out various subsidies to support corporations, especially SMEs, so that they can continue business without firing workers. And, uh, and also the Japanese government uh, created the problem for, for subsidized loans for troubled companies. And uh, uh, I think th these are, th th in, you know, in many countries, uh, the government stepped up and helped the corporation and helped the people. But the Japan seems to be doing, uh, has, be, has always doing this uh, during the crisis and uh, seems to be doing that again. And uh, these policies were successful in preventing corporate failures and maintain, maintaining employment. Uh, if you look at the unemployment rate for Japan, it hardly moved uh, even during the pandemic. And, uh, uh, but uh, these economic policies in Japan, um, you know, by, by the way, the, these are similar to the ones in Europe, as, as you discuss in, in the book. Uh, but uh, these policies would be good if the COVID-19 shock turned out to be a temporary one and, and everything goes back to normal. Again, this, this is something you mentioned in your book. But the uh, pandemic has been uh, with us for a long time now. And hopefully we are finally getting back to normal, but it seems that the new normal will be very different from the old one. And the, again, your, your book talks about uh, the various aspects, the new normal seems different from the old one. And if that's the case, policies to trying to protect the status quo, especially those corporations that are no longer, no longer viable, in the new normal, and uh, as you know, the technical term for them is zombies in economics. Um, the policies to protect zombie companies would just suppress the creative destruction that is necessary to change and move to the new normal. And, and again, we can talk about the negative externality that protecting some, com some non viable companies create a problem for other companies which requires protection again. So uh, that's a worry I have, or oh, that's a problem Japan had in the past crisis. And again, uh, I, I worry Japan may be making that mistake again. Um, and another thing, uh, another problem I find with the typical response of a Japanese government or Japan to the big crisis is uh, in addition to end up uh, protecting non-viable firms, the protection of corporations to protect the employment uh, actually doesn't protect all the employment. Uh, so that's Japan's another problem. Uh, the protected are just uh, uh, workers on so-called lifetime employment. Those workers at large companies, uh, and uh, uh, full-time employees and mainly men rather than women. So those part-timers, workers at small firms, women, they are not protected. And this is already, the problem is already observed in the COVID-19 pandemic. The, those uh, part-timers, uh, female workers, uh, lost jobs uh, than the men or the full-time. And this is an important area in Japan, and uh, that may be worsening the inequality. And you, you spent a lot of time talking about the inequality in your book again, in, in your book too, although you didn't have time to talk about it. So, uh, yeah, do, do, do you want to? Should, should, yeah. should I jump in occasionally? Or? Yes, please, please. Um, so there's a very interesting observation which is essentially that the covid crisis is a very exogenous shock so it comes it comes from outside mm -hmm. while financial crises always come with bubbles beforehand or that they are building up and there's an imbalance is building up if you look at for example in uh, japan in 1980s mm -hmm. and then you have this huge crisis and the and then the imbalance and takes a long while to, build, to undo the imbalances which were building up beforehand. And some people say, you know, COVID was, there was nothing wrong before COVID. And hence, once the corona threat goes away, we can come back to the old one. So we could bounce back much more quickly. So what you say in Japan, that's, there's hope at least that there's a quicker bounce back 
compared to the financial crisis Japan went through? Or you, you sounded a little bit more pessimistic. Uh, yes. So the, my pessimism comes from the, the Japanese economy before the COVID, right? Okay. So it may come back to the economic growth path before the COVID, uh, but uh, even before the COVID, the Japanese economy wasn't doing well. Well, it, it wasn't like the economy was growing very fast. And you showed a very nice figure comparing Japan's response to Germany's response in terms of uh, economic restrictions uh, uh, in during the COVID-19. As you see, Japan's policy was less lenient or less stringent, uh, more lenient compared with the policy taken by a German government or other, other governments in Europe. Uh, but still, the Japanese economy suffered uh, as much as the European economy suffered in terms of growth rate. And the important reason is the Japanese economy wasn't doing well before the COVID. So even, even if the, we are going back to the old normal, the Japanese economy has a problem. So perhaps I can ask you a question. Yeah. So one part in the book I described that actually the COVID crisis might be uh, a boost and for an uh, investment boom and also for innovation boom mm -hmm. and in particular in the area of uh, working from home there was you know a stigma attached to work from home and it changed really radically the way we probably will work at least uh, you know office workers will work from home and actually mm -hmm. you know academics will always work perhaps a little bit from home but for many many other it will be different mm -hmm. so you think in Japan this will be less of an issue that it will be less of uh, a change uh, because you will go back to working from, from office 100%? Or do you think there's US, you have both perspectives, the US and the Japanese perspective. Do you think it will be more radical in the US than in, in Japan? Going back to so, status quo? So, so, so I think US has a good chance of changing the situation than in Japan. And uh, I have a hope for, for Japan, uh, as you say this COVID-19 crisis can uh, turn out to be a chance for the Japanese economy to change. And there, there was a small, slow change going, away, go, going on uh, before the COVID-19 and that uh, trend for innovation uh, can accelerate during the, or as a result of the COVID-19. So, so I, I have that hope, but uh, it depends on how the Japanese government uh, uh, reacts to those uh, changes. And if the Japanese government allows those uh, productive innovations to happen, uh, then uh, it's, it's good. But uh, if there is a pressure to maintain the status quo, uh, those innovations can be crushed. So, so one thing I wondered uh, by uh, looking at your book or reading your book is about your title. The, I like the resilience, right. but there is a similar notion, but a slightly different notion of anti-fragile. It's a, a term coined by Nassim Taleb uh, in, in his book on anti-fragile. And uh, it's more than bouncing back. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned for the COVID-19, the COVID-19, the society, uh, can be anti-fragile, not only bouncing back to the, the, the normal or the same growth rate, it re actually reaches a better position or a higher growth because of the innovation which is responding to the crisis. So, so I wonder uh, what, what you think of this uh, notion of anti-fragile, and uh, it, I wonder if you thought about titling your book, Anti-Fragile Society, rather than uh, resilient society, and if so, why did you decide against that? So I actually haven't thought, I have to admit, I have to think more carefully uh, what exactly my reason was for, for the resilient society. So I was really contrasting it much more with risk and including tail risks and, um, and also with uh, robustness. And I was thinking about stability, but I haven't thought about, I've thought about vulnerability, you know, not having a vulnerable society, which is like before you have a crisis, it's an ex-ante perspective to be vulnerable. So I contrasted it very 
things, but I have to admit I haven't really contrasted with the fragility uh, at the same way uh, you pointed out. So I have to dive in a little bit more in depth to figure out the, the fragility difference. One thing is I think what's special about resilience is that you can actually get hit by a shock and uh, face the shock, you just bounce back. So it's not that you really try to avoid, uh, you know, um, being hit at all. I mean, that's, that, that's a big difference, mm -hmm. but I haven't really looked into fragility. It's a very good point. So I should have done it. I wish I would have talked earlier to you. Yeah, well, you, you, you can do that in the next book. Yes, I will, I will do it uh, the next few days. I will think about it. And uh, one, in one area I was thinking about this uh, resilience and anti-fragile is uh, Japanese ex Japan's experience after the earthquake in yes. 2011, which you talk about uh, you, you yes. using the figure. And as you can see, uh, Japan bounced back then to, to the no normal growth path, which wasn't very high, but uh, uh, still the normal path before the earthquake very quickly. Uh, but I hoped back then was more anti-fragility for the Japanese economy. In, uh, as, as I hope now that the COVID-19 shock can change the Japanese economy and move that mm -hmm. to a higher economic growth path, I hoped uh, something like that could have happened after the earthquake, which uh, didn't happen. So, even though the Japanese economy bounced back, I was a little bit disappointed by that outcome. Yeah, so I think if I may jump in, uh, mm -hmm. um, yes, so please. Fukushima or the earthquake shock was mm -hmm. essentially an exogenous, clearly an exogenous shock. And typically when you there's some destruction, you have to rebuild a lot and that stimulates the economy automatically. Yeah. In this sense, it's very different from a financial crisis. Mm -hmm where you have overbuilt houses or real estate, and then you have to clear these imbalances. So in a sense, you know, it was more natural to bounce back if you have some destruction of some production capacity. Um, and, but I agree with you that probably resilience means that you bounce back to some new normal and which might be slightly different. I mean, it might be even better than the old normal. And, um, right. And fragility might be, you're not, you know, if you hit, you not spiral out of control. So, uh, so, so you, you know, you, you mentioned or you emphasized the difference between the COVID-19 or a natural disaster, which are exogenous shock, to a financial crisis, which is an endogenous shock. It uh, happens as a result of uh, accumulation of uh, too much credit and so on and the debt overhang. And one potential problem I think we need to worry about is that this COVID-19 can develop into a financial crisis or a debt overhang mm -hmm. type of problem. Uh, partly because of the generous government support or the government subsidized loan programs which are happening in Japan. I'm not sure about Europe. Uh, so what, what the, and I agree with you completely that uh, efficient mechanism for debt restructuring is necessary, and I think that's something the Japanese uh, or Japan should work on. Uh, but uh, so, what do you think of this uh, danger of a debt overhang problem for the other countries or, or including Japan? Yeah, I think that's it's a very good point. Uh, in particular, uh, sovereign debt overhang. So you see it on mm -hmm. reading certain emerging economies, and they can't pay back the debt. So now we, you know, at this stage, it's still fine. There are already some uh, countries which don't pay back. They are late in paying back the debt, mm -hmm. but there will be a serious, probably serious sovereign debt crisis coming up because uh, if you look at the sovereign debt levels, so the public debt or the government debt is really going through the roof. And the question is, how do we deal with that when we have a debt overhang problem? And we don't have it in the national arena, some sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, same thing as a bankruptcy law we had at the national level. Mm -hmm. And here we will face serious challenges uh, coming up. And I hope we will grow fantastically in the next few years and we can resolve that. But if not, there will be serious challenges 
in many, many countries, especially poorer countries. Uh, mm -hmm. And you totally pointing the, put the finger at the right point mm -hmm. um, where it's really, you know, some challenges coming up in the near future, in the next few years. Yeah, or, or the government increased the level of deficit and the level of debt. But I, would, I was surprised Japan was able to do that too. And I, I think it was a good thing. Uh, it allowed Japanese government or Japan to respond to the acute crisis like the pandemic. But uh, the level of the government debt in Japan was already high, uh, yeah. extremely high. Uh, that, that worried some people like us. And we, we've been saying for the last 15 years, the Japanese government level was that high. And so I was a bit surprised Japan was able to get away with a higher, even higher debt level. Yeah, so there's some, uh, some as two aspects, uh, let me have two reactions to that. One mm -hmm. is, uh, if you are able to issue a safe asset like the Japanese government bond or the US treasury or the German bond, you can go much deeper into debt than other countries. And Japan is in the privilege of doing this. And that allows Japan to, so it has good institutional structures and is well regarded. And I often say, what's a safe asset? A safe asset is what I call a safe asset ontology. A safe asset is safe because it is safe uh, or, or put it differently because it's perceived to be safe. And people know when there's a crisis, they are rush into the safe assets and everybody will rush into the safe assets. And that allows Japan to have these huge debt levels, which, you know, very puzzling otherwise. Uh, I think that's really some, some privileges uh, Japan has. And, but, you know, at some point it might be too dangerous and one has to watch out for that. Uh, you can't stretch it too far. But uh, the safe assets, so the, the book devotes a big chunk of it to explain what a safe asset is and why certain nations have these privileges and many emerging economies don't have these privileges. Mm -hmm. And even though their debt level is way lower than let's say the Japanese debt level, uh, there will actually be in difficulties while Japan will not. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's you know something to uh, take into account. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, safe assets are safe because they are perceived to be safe. And uh, I, I think that's the case too. But uh, as, as you implied, the perception can change. So mm -hmm. that uh, I, I so, so I worried about the Japanese government debt before the pandemic. I, I think I worried about the Japanese government to. Uh, so perhaps I can. I forgot one more thing. There is this yeah. saying: you only have to be the least ugly horse. Essentially, if everybody increases at that level. You just have to be safer than than the other governments or put it differently it's a little bit like i don't know whether you remember this joke but uh, there are two people uh you know seeing there's a tiger escape from the yeah. zoo and so one guy says you know you know uh, we have to run and then that way and put the uh, jogging shoes on mm -hmm. and i uh, said oh i'm fine because only what they have to do is to run faster than you and i know i'm faster <laughs> than you uh, and that's a little bit what's going on here and the, the debt mm -hmm. level too, you know, if you... Right. So, least, so may, uh, maybe uh, Japanese government debt is safer now maybe because of the la large government debt in maybe, other countries. Maybe, but only slightly, not much. I would <laughs> say. <laughs> okay. And, and as you mentioned, there's always a tipping point. Yes. And for the perception, the, that's something we, we, we need to worry about, e even though there's some, there, there's no, there, there seems to be no problem today. Uh, you know, there, there may be some tipping points where the, everybody starts to doubt the, the safe yes. asset uh, status of the Japanese government bond. Indeed, I think that's a big uh a trouble and we don't know where the tipping point is. So in many mm -hmm. circumstances, we know where the tipping point is and then you can avoid it. But if you don't know where the tipping point is, that makes the situation very complicated and, uh, and mm -hmm. more worrisome. Uh, I think that's indeed the case. And what's even more worrisome, so if I may just, it seems like the Western world cannot afford another financial crisis because mm -hmm. then we would enter a huge political crisis and who knows, where we would end up with democracies. And, and so mm -hmm. we have to be more careful in order mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, preserve a free and open society. Mm -hmm.
So talking about the financial crisis and the financial system, you know, this is of course uh, something you have been working on for, for a long, long time. And as you convincingly show in your book, the financial system this time during the pandemic, pandemic uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the financial system showed remarkable resiliency uh, in, in many aspects. And how much of this success do you think uh, can be explained by our experience of going through the global financial crisis 10 years ago? You know, we, we, we must have learned something. And what, yes. what were the keys? I think uh, we quite a lot, I would say, because we just use the same tools as we used 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago. And uh, so one thing was, which was special about the COVID crisis was it was even faster than the global financial crisis, way faster. Mm -hmm. But we had the experience, as you mentioned, from the previous crisis, and we could react. So that was one big advantage. So the, the central banks reacted incredibly fast. Within a few weeks, they put everything into place and just mm -hmm. uh, undusted their old uh, policy programs. But there was another big difference uh, during the global financial crisis. The fiscal authorities, so the governments, didn't really react fast. And this time around, the governments reacted much quicker as well. And in many countries, the big difference was that actually the moral hazard was not uh, so pronounced. So while if you look at the euro crisis, for example, uh, people blamed Greece for going heavily into debt. Mm -hmm. It was not okay. And hence, they have to be punished in a sense for doing this and otherwise to do it again. But this way, this time around, it was a COVID. It was an outside shock and it was nobody's fault. And this way, it was much easier for politicians to really help out dramatically. Mm -hmm. So some people compare the responses, the government's responses in financial policy or stabilizing financial system to the government's policy in healthcare, the fighting mm -hmm. the health crisis of the COVID-19. There, um, I, I, I guess it, it's fair to say we saw less Rather less fast uh, international cooperation on handling the pandemic. And uh, do, do you think uh, we will be able to learn from this experience again for, for the future pandemic? Indeed. So what you see actually, the, the countries who, which went through SARS-1, mm -hmm. they handled initially mm -hmm. the, the COVID crisis much better than uh, your mm -hmm. Europe or the US who didn't experience the SARS-1 crisis. The so, so like uh, South Korea. Yes, South, South Korea or Taiwan, or mm -hmm. they did this much better than, than other countries. And uh, so the experience typically helps that you have been through. The other thing is what's a little bit more challenging in the health side. It took us a long while to figure out how the virus works. You know? mm. What is it through touching or through the air? And there's many things. It, and it does instill a lot of confidence if the government says we have to do this and then you mm -hmm. learn a month later no it was actually this and then oh we have to change gears we have to do something different and that makes it very hard for policymakers to make recommendations and then shift gears all the time and maintain the credibility okay it's it's already very close to <laughs> an hour and uh, we we are having too much uh, good time uh J jim and masashi do, do you want to do you want something Kitakeo, yeah, uh, we are coming up on an hour, and and again, um, as has been the case with uh, several of these conversations, we are having too much fun, and, uh, but there comes a time when we have to wrap things up. So I'm going to turn um, things over to Masashi if he has any last minute um, thoughts, comments, uh, questions, um, and then I will um, wrap things up. Yeah, and I said the same thing last uh, yesterday uh, when uh, I joined the discussion between uh, discussion with national. Affairs researchers, but how to compromise the local, uh, especially the national and uh, the global, that is uh, extremely uh, important uh, in my view to uh, to face uh, the pandemic crisis, because you know that uh, every, so far as I understand, almost everything has been discussed uh, by using the framework of a nation state, a national economy. But uh, uh, Takeo uh, mentioned uh, a little bit about the, how to say, the, 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 the crisis in, in, in the world, global crisis. Mm 
that national interest is of course important, but it doesn't matter uh, so far as the pandemic is concerned. This is the crisis in the world, and we need to uh, find uh, uh, a way of solving uh, the, the issue, the question uh, globally. And uh, in this respect, uh, I uh, found some uh, chapters uh, using the term uh, global in Mark's book. And so if you uh, have something to say about this, uh, how to solve the question uh, globally, uh, please let me know just briefly. Okay, no, this is a really excellent point. Uh, it's very, very important. And you know, what really is striking is that the COVID crisis is a global threat to the whole world or all humans. And we actually entered in a phase where it became, you know, very nationalistic and uh, protectionistic in a sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, your face mask diplomacy and all these things uh, are playing out there. And you could see it even within Europe. And then there was through some leadership of certain leaders intervention that there will be no national interest are allowed to play out. It has to be European interest. But you know, actually what we really need is a global interest. And I think what we need is some enlightened leaders who have, take a global perspective and also multilateral institutions which have more to say in these dimensions. So institutional frameworks combined with enlightened leaders are really necessary because things can go very, very quickly, very wrong. And uh, that's essentially uh, all what one can say at this stage, but I think it's really important. It's really uh, essential in order to really manage all the future problems and future shocks. Most of them will be global shocks. And I think a single country alone won't be able to handle it. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, so Marcus, you talk about uh, individual level resi resilience and the society level resilience and the global resilience. And for the shock like this, the global resilience is what is important for us. Ideally, we have all the resilience all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, on that um, optimistic note, um, I, I'd like to wrap things up by thanking both Marcus and Takeo for taking your time for joining us, um, contributing to the partnership in this way. Um, this is uh, fantastic. One of the things that I really enjoyed um, listening and playing the role of moderator is to hear things that are relevant to the things that I study. And in this case, uh, it's about the, the social contract, for example, and the different mechanisms that uh, more or less effectively uh, support that in different places. And then from that learning about related factors that I have no real understanding of, such as uh, uh, macroeconomic outcomes. So this is really a, a fascinating part uh, of this kind of conversation for me. And certainly I hope for others who are uh, listening to these conversations. So again, um, with that, I'd like to thank you both for uh, joining us tonight. Marcus, uh, you've sold another book. Um, I look forward to reading it. And even better, I look forward to having a chance to talk with you. I, I, I will bring you a copy to Wallace Hall. <laughs> okay. Even better, even better. Okay, so thank you both very much. Uh, I look forward to seeing you. Uh, and again, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye.